Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever you're joining us, and welcome to today's webinar titled Economic Impact of Representativeness in Clinical Trials, How Real-World Data Can Help, featuring four experts who will explore the economic impact and role of real-world evidence in improving the representativeness of research. I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's event, Cardinal Health, for making it all possible. Now, before I hand the presentation over to our moderator, I'd like to introduce the panelists participating in today's session. I'll first introduce Dr. Bruce Feinberg, Vice President, Clinical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer for Cardinal Health Specialty Solutions. He is nationally recognized for his expertise in specialty oncology and the business of specialty healthcare. He'll also be your moderator for today's event. Next up, we have Dr. Danielle Gentile, Senior Scientist for Real World Evidence and Insights at Cardinal Health. She investigates the health outcomes of patients treated in real-world settings outside of clinical trials. Our third speaker is Dr. Parisa Ascarizabet, whose ex expertise lies in statistical analysis, database management, and clinical and economic outcomes research of real-world data from chart review forms, administrative claims databases, disease registries, and patient-reported data. The final participant with us today is Alexandrina Balian Balanian, lead publication scientist, strategic research at Cardinal Health. She has over 15 years of expertise in scientific research and communication, including medical writing, editing, and managing peer-reviewed journals. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Bruce to join me and all of our other speakers. Okay, take it all away. Right. So thank you for the introductions and helping out with the housekeeping notes to those who are listening. Uh, as as uh, was stated, I'm Bruce Feinberg. I'm a medical oncologist by background. For the past oh, near 13 years, I've been with Cardinal Health as chief medical officer. My passion is around real world evidence research. And we're going to be talking about the way in which real world evidence research can play a critical role uh, in continuing to build upon evidence-based medicine, which means understanding the origins of evidence-based medicine, what, were, what was the real pivotal point of modern medicine in being able to do randomized controlled clinical trials, but the limitations of that methodology and some of the things we're learning now about it, particularly representativeness. So we don't often have six syllable words in our program titles, but to address this issue, it's complicated. It's not one thing. And it's much more than maybe what we're hearing about in this conversation, broader societal conversation about wokeness and diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion. And I want you to put on a scientific framework to understand how these issues have a very significant impact on what we're trying to understand about the outcomes of patients treated with chronic and life-threatening diseases and, and important steps that need to be taken in order to advance the cause of evidence-based medicine. So that in a nutshell is what we're gonna be going after today. Um, if we put it into an agenda, we're gonna break it up into three sections, review the current state of clinical trial underrepresentation, and Alex will be doing that. We're gonna move next to uh, Danielle, and she's gonna talk about understanding how real world data and real world evidence can help fill gaps in representativeness of clinical trials. And then Parisa will close us out by exploring the economic impact of underrepresentation in clinical trials. We'll leave time for Q&A. So throughout, if you've got questions as they come up, post them. We'll be likely trying to hold off and doing all the Q&A at the end so we can kind of filter through all the questions and try to deal with them in clusters as best we can. So with that, we're gonna move on to Alex and she's gonna begin this conversation with a, with a discussion around clinical trial underrepresentation and its implications. Alex, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. I'm happy to be here. I'll start us off here. We're gonna first take a look at a general overview of clinical research ethics and underrepresentation. So ethics, we really didn't have them back when clinical research began. Um, and there were some misguided beliefs based on race that caused a lot of unethical practices. So for example, in the 1840s, they were doing uh, experimental surgeries on black female slaves without anesthesia because doctors believed that black women didn't feel pain as white women did. 
And then for about 40 years, beginning in 32, the US government sponsored the Tuskegee syphilis study. And they wanted to look at untreated syphilis by deceiving black men into participating, telling them they're gonna get treatment for their bad blood when in effect, they weren't getting any treatment at all, not even when penicillin became available in 1940s. And then in the 60s, we started to get a little bit better. In 65, the NIH passed a law that anyone who applies for domestic grant would have to comply with prohibiting discrimination based on things like race or sex of a participant if they wanted any federal funding for their medical facilities or their hospitals. And then another good sign was in 93, the NIH Revitalization Act ensured or was meant to ensure that clinical researchers uh, make sure that their interventions are tested to see whether they affect men, women, or minority populations differently. And then about uh, several years later in 2020, the AMA instituted new policies. Instead of teaching race as biology, they taught it as what it is, which is a social construct. And they also no longer um, are allowing race to be used as a proxy for biology in medicine or in research. And then uh, to, to my great pleasure, and I'm sure everyone on the panel here and probably in the audience, if you saw the article in Nature about a month ago, the FDA announced that they're gonna begin requiring companies seeking approval for late stage clinical trials to submit plans for actually ensuring uh, that diverse participants are included in the trials. So then as we say in research, so what, right? Well, the implications actually apply to all of us, not just those of us who are underrepresented. Um, so clinical trials are enormously expensive um, and only about 5% of patients in the US are gonna participate in those. And on top of that, about only 40% report demographics of the participants. And of those averages, which is what I have here to show you, 84% are still white, 7% black, 3% Asian, 3% Hispanic, and only about half are women. Um, but that's an average and it varies widely depending on the drugs that are tested. And most of them are white. Um, and then of the cancer drugs that are approved for the FDA, adequate representation is not uniformly distributed, let's say. Um, what that means is, is the population in the trial reflective of the population um, in the general um, patient population that will be affected by the disease? And for women, it's only about 79% adequate. For men, older adults, 65 and up, it's only 27%. And then for racial or ethnic minorities, it's only about 11%. Um, and these expensive clinical trials, about 20% of them actually end early, and about 40% of those are because they can't get enough participants. Um, so most clinical trials are federally funded, so in essence, our tax dollars are being wasted when they end early. Also, if the drugs aren't treated on the patients they're meant for, we won't have complete data. And at a population level, women may have different hormonal makeups or some racial minorities may have different genetic mutations or predispositions to particular comorbidities. Um, and if we don't know that, we don't test them. At best, it can be an ineffective drug, but at worst, you can have adverse events that were unforeseen and unexpected due to maybe incorrect dosing. So we can see this is not just a, you know, a research matter. Um, it's actually a real life matter for all of us and the drugs that are being developed, especially in oncology. Um, this actually compounds healthcare disparities, adding further to the economic impact of having these kinds of trials not representing everyone, and it costs the U.S. billions of dollars probably every year. And I'll let Paris explain more into the details of, of that. So I'd like to close with this wonderful graphic, and to me it's like a picture being worth a thousand words, because it shows the difference between equality and equity. So equality on top means that everyone has the same resources and opportunities. So it's, there's a level playing field per se. Um, equity simply means fairness and it recognizes that we don't all have the same circumstances at the start. So we need different resources and opportunities to reach the equal outcome. Here, for example, giving everyone the same bike to get from point A to point B is equality, but not everyone can use the same bike because their body types are different. And then at the bottom, if you give everyone the bike that's appropriate for them, they can use that then to get to point B on their own. So that's really in a nutshell what equity is. And I think over the past two years, more clinical trials have been done in cancer drugs than anything else. 
And so this year with the FDA requiring diversity plans prior to the beginning of trials, it's very encouraging, at least to me, and I think probably to most of us here, that this underrepresentation is no longer just something that public health officials talk about, but now we're going to actually have to see changes. And with that, I will close. Thank you. All right. Well, Alex, you got us off gangbusters for our start. So <laughs> love that. Um, love, love the image to deal with equity and equality. And what's interesting is that we've maybe had a decade now in which this has been front and center in social conversation. Mm -hmm. And you and I were talking uh, last week that just watching shows that are even supposed to be progressive in terms of content, like Bill Maher, <laughs> right, and right. got equity totally wrong. Totally missed the point there. And, and, and so it, it's it, when we include these things, we sometimes include them because there seems to be this, this continued need, right? Education is about, is about you know, constantly reinforcing mm -hmm. the information that we're providing. And, and so I want to make sure that the audience understands that we're not we're not hell bent, you know, on trying to change people to our perspective. We're trying to help them understand that there's a scientific basis. There's a history for why the situation is what it is. There's a scientific reason why it needs to change. And it's not about us. It's not necessarily for a social ordering. It's really about and Parisa is going to really get somewhat to the core of it because it's going to really be about it. In a way, it gets down to economics. But um, you've been you've been involved in this work now for for over a decade. Uh -huh. Do you, you you as you go through that history? Do you think there's progress? Like you know, it's often of you know are, are are the right things being said, but the changes that actually will alter the the the, the fundamentals not change not there, or do you think the progress is being made? Well, I am a natural pessimist, Bruce, but in this case, I actually do think that there is progress. It's just a lot slower than you or I would, would like to see. Um, we have not been talking about this nearly as long as I've been studying it, but just the fact that it's in the news, it's in, you know, social justice is becoming widespread. It's not just something that we would talk about in our, you know, ivory towers, for instance, and write papers on. I do think there's progress, but like you said, the fundamental issue is that we have to educate ourselves, be aware of ourselves and learn what's going on there. We don't all walk in the same world. And the more that we can use that to develop better drugs for cancers and other chronic diseases, the healthier we're all gonna be. All right, so, so Danielle, the more we can develop those drugs, that requires methodologic proof. And you're gonna get into that. And and I, this is not necessarily bashing the classical clinical trial, that the purpose of this talk. And and so as, as we start to transition and think, when you think about this, um, I'm, I'm assuming you want to look at the strengths of clinical trial, but then what could be done to further refine and prove them? Yeah, and in my section, I'll be speaking about how clinical trials are the gold standard, the highest form of evidence. They do their best to isolate the treatment effect and pull out as many other factors as possible. But that's not the end all be all, and that's not real world. That's not the only thing that we can base um, what patients are able to experience in their treatments. So we have to use the real world outcomes as well. So they can be complementary to each other. And each of them has their own limitations. Um, and usually what happens in the medical field is the treatment decisions are based upon clinical trials. But then we have to understand how does this actually affect patients outside of these very tightly controlled settings? So I look forward to speaking more on that. Great. And Parisa, it's often where the rubber meets the road is the expression often used when it comes down to the economics. And it would be great if, if society in general would recognize the issues that Alex talked about as the right thing to do, but often is it the right thing to do becomes the, econ the right economic thing to do. But in this case, they're perfectly aligned. And I know that you'll be going into that. Um, we're talking about healthcare is 20% now. It's a, right, it's a, I think a fifth of the total economy is related to healthcare. And so much of that then ties into effectiveness um, with, with safety. 
because when things aren't effective, you throw money mm-hmm. in things without benefit. And when, when they're not safe, you create new problems that are, could be more costly than the problem you were trying to take care of. You're going to have a limited amount of time, but, but just kind of as kind of a little bit of a tease, what you'll be getting into. Yeah, sure. Uh, so like uh, Alex mentioned uh, in this new guideline that FDA released on um, requiring the clinical trials to uh, submit a plan on increasing the diversity, they also require um, clinical trials to report on how the treatment effect might be different between subgroups, in uh, between racial and ethnic um, minority groups. And that is very crucial because uh, if we find out that the treatment effect is different between subgroups, uh, then we can generate hypotheses and they can, a new hypothesis, they, we can take innovative actions to actually address those. And these differences actually cost us money. And uh, I, will, um, I, uh, I will discuss more about this, but in 2010 only, in cancer only, uh, cost of racial ethnic disparities was $197 billion. Imagine if we can even slightly reduce the disparities by improving the representation in clinical trials, there's, signif- there's potential for significant cost savings. And it is just for cancer. We, uh, we, uh, disparities exist in chronic conditions, in every single uh, um, field of um, healthcare. If we uh, look at, there is some form of disparities that increasing representation can, has potential to improve that. All right, ladies, we're gonna continue. Let's get back to slides and some of the didactics. And so Danielle, we move to you. Real world evidence can help fill gaps in clinical trial representativeness is the title of the didactic piece that you'll be covering. And then we'll once again get into a little conversation afterwards. Take it away. Thank you. So what I'm going to do today in my section is to provide a visual representation of clinical trials and then a visual representation of real world evidence and spend some time comparing and contrasting the two. Both have strengths, both have limitations. So let's begin with clinical trials. And the essential question that a clinical trial seeks to answer is, does the intervention work in an ideal setting? So let's describe that ideal setting. We have a disease at hand. So what scientists will do is do a rigorous review of planning a clinical trial. So there will be particular patients that will be enrolled into that clinical trial. These patients are often younger, better functional status, higher likelihood of being white, Sometimes there's not as good representation of female patients and so on, some things that Alex covered earlier. So those patients who meet that very strict eligibility criteria will then go through an informed consent process so that the patient really understands what the study will involve, the risks and so on, and decide if they do want to participate. So at that point, patients will be randomized into two groups. There's the treatment or intervention group, which is on the left in the slide, and then there's the control on the right. So those patients who do receive the drug on the treatment will be compared to those patients who did not. And there will be very strict predefined monitoring and assessments of the patients in both groups. And then the outcomes will be compared with one another. So this is why they're the gold standard of evidence, because they're able to uh, isolate the effect of the intervention by controlling influential factors. So for instance, they may decide to exclude patients who have had a different type of cancer in their history before the current cancer that is being studied. So this is, in summary, a very rigorous uh, application of science. It doesn't really reflect what happens in the real world. So next, I have what does happen in the real world. And this is all of us. This is myself. This is you. This is all of our relatives and friends. Um, Every time that you or I go to the doctor, 
it uh, generates data, and that data is captured in the electronic medical record. So they might uh, capture uh, information about our comorbidities. For example, if a patient has high blood pressure, it might capture our weight, height, those sort of baseline characteristics. And then as we progress through treatment or whatever the um, the healthcare pathway is, that will generate outcomes. And these outcomes happen on a non-specific timetable. So it might be that I get my assessment at three months, but my friend gets her assessment at six months, and I get a certain uh, instrument to assess my outcomes, and she gets a different one. So the real world has more complexities, but it is really what's happening. So essentially the question of real world evidence is does the intervention work in real life? And so there's not this uh, separating patients out into intervention and control and comparing them. This is moving through treatment as it really happens. And I have these gray circles here which are all influencing real world evidence. And the great diversity that everyone brings to um, this type of research. So it can be patients with variable socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, gender, functional status, age, uh, experiencing treatment in different medical systems, different medical settings. So maybe that's a rural area, maybe it's a city, maybe it's an academic medical uh, center that has a lot of resources and the most available uh, up-to-date equipment versus areas that are lower resourced and may not have all of the best and current uh, resources at their disposal. So in summary, a comparison of we have our clinical trials. This is very rigorous, um, very pre-prescribed, and it's not the real world, but it does generate the highest form of evidence. And then we have real world evidence, which is what happens every day when you or I go to see our healthcare providers. And they can work together with each other. So those outcomes which are observed in clinical trials can be combined with real world evidence. And in that way, we have a fuller picture of does it work in an ideal setting and does it work in real life? So that's what I have and I look forward to discussing more. Well, thanks, Danielle. I think I love that. And when I, when I think about the, his, the history, especially in the world of cancer, we lived for a few decades under the belief that was somewhat proven that it was taking 12 years for a, a new drug to get mm -hmm. from the laboratory bench to the patient's bedside where it's administered. Because in that era of cancer, much of those drugs were administered in the hospital. And so the 12 year. And as you mentioned, many of those trials that were initiated didn't even complete because of difficulties in accrual. And part of that reason that patients weren't able to go on is they didn't meet eligibility. But there is a confounding problem that if you're the, the physician, as I was, and patient after patient after patient is not eligible, you stop looking and conducting the exercise. You kind of give up on the system. It's kind of broken. It doesn't work for me. I can't, I'm not going to be evaluating all of my patients. And so we start having kind of this layered problem that increases the amount of time decreases the number of drugs that fully evaluated, and it becomes a spiral. It seems like there's recognition now that that spiral is no longer acceptable. In fact, I think it was Robert Cowell of just this week made a presentation, new, the new FDA director, that we've got to go back to a thought process about trials being bigger, trials being more inclusive, and it, but it's more than just the eligibility, right? It, it's, it's also finding ways that allow patients to participate. And when I think about that traditional methodology they're describing, for a lot of patients who are full-time working, they don't have the time to participate in the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. It does. It's more timely. It may be only done in the academic center. It, it, you know, it, it, there's those elements there. And so methodologically, we're seeing a lot of things happening. We don't have time to get into all of them, but maybe you could just touch on 
some of the things that are changing in the approach where real world evidence won't just be something we do after the drug is approved after the 12 years, but real world evidence is going to help us to shorten that time and actually give us more information before the drug is available in the market. Yeah, those are great reflections. So it makes me think of something really essential in my training background in public health, and that is the discovery delivery disconnect. So the discovery the discovery might be what happens in the clinical trial. We find that a particular drug increases survival time. And then the delivery might be when this actually hits the population 12 years later. So that's the disconnect is that what we learn in rigorous clinical scientific settings takes a long time to get to the actual population. So when you're speaking about drug approval, and how it can be so very limited in terms of the patients that do participate, and that doesn't really relate to uh, patients in the real world, real world evidence can serve as a complement to the, the insights that are gained by clinical trials. So we will never be able to run a clinical trial with millions of patients. That's just not feasible. But in the real world, millions of patients may mis receive that drug. And we can use that data that's generated in the real world evidence to compare and look, how does this differ, if it does differ, from the clinical trial results? And if so, what does that mean for clinical practice? Is there a subgroup of patients that does not benefit from this medication as much as those in the clinical trial did? And we use those things in summary. We are triangulating different sources of data to come to the best conclusions that we can based on the evidence. Thanks, Danielle. Barisa, it, it's been said that in that 12 year time, it was required, has a cost of greater than a billion dollars to bring a drug. Now that's not just that one drug, but it's also the drugs that failed, but it is that time. It's the time, kind of the time value of money. And uh, so part of that cost and that economics is not just on the in, a drug that is ineffective or less effective in certain populations or less safe in certain populations. It's also getting to that knowledge a lot, a lot quicker in terms of that economic impact. And I don't know if you'll have time to get into that aspect today, but that seems to be another opportunity where, for instance, if you create a synthetic control arm, essentially a, a control arm of patients who are getting standard of care, who do look like the patients in the trial, you don't have to accrue them through a typical consent process, which can be so labor intensive and, and historically, for the reasons Alex said, often has patients dropping out mm -hmm. or right. refusing. So when you get into the economics, to what extent can we really understand all these different, like, so not just understanding when the drug doesn't work or doesn't work as effectively in certain populations as it's safe, but also the time it takes for development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so real world evidence is a great source of, it is a large uh, source of data and it provides information on very diverse population. And um, it has it has good potential to increase the diversity and increase the sample size for clinical trials. Um, re researchers have been uh, trying to uh, use real world evidence to find a modified inclusion and exclusion criteria to find out which ones are the most limiting, and if we, which ones can be removed to create more diverse population. And you can do this using claims data. You can do this with uh, using EMR data. And uh, this way, you, you have um, to modify inclusion exclusion criteria in a reasonable way that you can, um, uh, you can um, have more patients participating and at the same time in, uh, increase the diversity. Uh, also, uh, this is very important in rare disease areas because uh, it is uh, difficult to find patients with rare disease uh, in rare disease area. But like since uh, there are like millions of uh, patients in um, uh, real world evidence data, you can find uh, centers that uh, are treating these patients, and this way you can actually facilitate uh, patient recruitment, uh, inc increase your diversity.
and also another way is to actually like you mentioned uh, create um synthetic control on uh, nowadays using placebo is for because of um ethical issues it's not really recommended you uh, you would need to have standard care as we control on when it is possible you can totally do that with real world evidence you can create a synthetic control arm without the need for investment in recruiting patients and going through that whole process of clinical trial and uh, investing significant uh, significant money and time all right so alex as we finish up this little conversation and move on to parissa's didactic element um, I'm going to throw you a bit of a curveball because I didn't tell you I was going to do this because I didn't know because it just made me think of it in this. But okay. but we think about some of the, the the limitations. We also have a lot of irrational behavior that happens with patients, as we mm -hmm. learned with COVID, who reject therapies that appear to be proven and valid. And I think often the problem is they're worried that the people who are part of the studies didn't look like them. And I'm wondering if if we can, if we can remove the, some of the barriers, we can get youth real world evidence to be able to reflect a population that's broader and more inclusive that we may have greater uptake of the patients themselves and saying it was tested in patients like me, I'm going to be more willing to accept it. I think we absolutely could Bruce. It'd be a massive undertaking, but we are certainly um, at a level in, in society where we're able to do that. The issue is you can, let's just say, bring the horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So if we as scientists don't communicate effectively what we know in ways that the general public can digest, they're just going to ignore it. And given a lot of the historical um, uh, precedents, there's a lot of mistrust in people who don't look like people. Um, like with the COVID vaccines, uh, a lot of people who were African-American or black were hesitant to get it. And given the history that I've relayed, it's it's not hard to see why, but it's, it's upon us as clinicians and as scientists to educate them. And um, on the flip side, if we could recruit more um, physicians who look like them into medicine, that would be the other the other prong where let's, let's all get more of us that look like us in this field, I think is actually a, a big area that we could use a lot of improvement in. I love it. I love that you're, it, it, get, it goes beyond just the, tr the patients in the trial. It's the right. physicians conducting the trial where right. we need to also expand and the representativeness. Absolutely. Right. And there's also a misconception that maybe some people don't want to participate in trials as much, but there are studies that show that Black people will be just as willing to participate if we only ask them. So there are also biases that come into play. Right. But that, and that get right as we talked about earlier, as I commented that when you Absolutely. when patients keep getting rejected, rejected, you start to think, well, they're not, you know, what's the point of asking them to begin with? Exactly. Right. Yep. All right. So, Parisa, we move on. And the last of the three kind of didactic sessions before we get into our final conversation in Q&A um, is going to be on the economics and is the economic impact of clinical trial under representation. Thanks, Dr. Feinberg. Um, so today I will first review the findings from our uh, internal study on representativeness of clinical trials. Then we will discuss the economic impact of underrepresentation in clinical trials and better and how real world evidence can help. In this internal study, we uh, selected seven real-world evidence oncology uh, studies that were conducted in Cardinal Health, and we found comparable uh, clinical trials for these studies, and we extracted the data for these, um, for these trials from clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, overall, we observed that um, compared to real-world evidence, um, Patients in clinical trials were significantly younger. They were less likely to be female, black or African American. The difference, the magnitude of difference here is uh, very large. And uh, they are also very, uh, they are also less likely to be Hispanic. Uh, the results uh, suggest that uh, real world evidence um, is, uh, has a great potential to complement the evidence that has been generated from clinical trials because it um, provides information on more diverse population and the results could be more generalizable to the target population. So lack of diversity uh, has some economic uh, impacts. By diversity here, we mean diversity by age, sex, gender, race, ethnicity, and all other forms of diversity. 
first and foremost, when there is uh, not enough diversity in the data, um, then uh, the generalizability of the results uh, gets uh, compromised. And with that comes other issues. Uh, FDA um, approval for new interventions um, are usually restricted to the population that um, have been included in the clinical trial and for the indication that has been studied. So a population that could potentially benefit from this um, intervention, uh, they will have limited access to it. Real world evidence, once this interven these interventions become available to the pop um, in market, uh, can use the um, real, uh, real world data uh, to help with expansion of label to new population or to the new in, uh, indication without the need for investing and ex spending um, um, money and time on conducting another clinical trial for this purpose. Um, some safety and uh, some safety concerns and some uh, rare and uh, severe adverse events they might occur only among uh, older patients or patients that have multi multimorbidity. These patients are usually excluded from clinical trials, and we might not. Uh, and these adverse events might not show up in the clinical trial results. But real world uh, data, because it is larger and it is more diverse, uh, can provide more comprehensive information on these concerns. And clinicians could use uh, this evidence to take actions to improve the safety of uh, the treatment by modifying the dosing by um, and, and uh, improving the safety. And also they can use uh, this evidence to reduce the intensity of adverse events or take actions to completely um, prevent them from happening. And this um, in turn can result in lower healthcare utilization and healthcare spending. Uh, clinical trials usually have enough participants to test for their primary hypotheses because they are expensive and they, uh, they are time consuming. Um, they would have enough uh, population for just test for the hypo primary hypotheses, but they will be underpowered for conducting subgroup analysis, which is essential for understanding the heterogeneity of the treatment effect. Is the treatment um, effect difference uh, different between uh, different racial groups, ethnic groups, um, and um, real world data, where, because it is larger and more diverse can provide a sufficient sample size uh, to be able to investigate these differences. Uh, if once we, we know that there is a difference, uh, this results in uh, generating new hypotheses, taking uh, innovative actions to address this, and uh, this could lead to reducing uh, health disparities. As we discussed earlier, health disparities uh, exist in all um, um, fields of healthcare, and they have been persistent in the United States. Um, and they have many underlying reasons. Uh, social determinants of health are the most uh, important ones. And it would be naive to assume that if we increase the representation of minority groups, we are somehow going to uh, eliminate the disparities. However, if we improve the, uh, if we have underrepresentation, this can reinforce health disparities. Annual cost of racial ethnic disparities in cancer only was $197 billion in 2010. And if we assume that uh, by improving rep uh, representation, we can uh, reduce this disparity by a small effect size, uh, there is potential for uh, great, uh, great savings in resources. Um, when a group of uh, patients are completely excluded from a clinical trial, um, they might not uh, trust the results from the trials, and they might be hesitant towards uh, receiving it. Um, one recent example was hesitancy of uh, pregnant women towards receiving COVID vaccines. Um, these patients, uh, pregnant women, were not included in clinical trials uh, for the vaccines. And real world evidence, uh, gener real world data generated evidence on safety and effectiveness of uh, COVID vaccines on uh, pregnant women. And then clinicians could actually refer to these results uh, when they were recommending the va vaccination for pregnant women. Uh, we also uh, discussed that uh, real world evidence has potential to increase the diversity of uh, the population and participants in clinical trials. 
trials, and it can lead to uh, increased low accrual rate and increased success rate for clinical trials, which are extremely expensive and time consuming. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Feinberg. Um, Thank you, Parisa. All right. So before we go to Q&A, let me just remind everyone that in the remaining minutes, you still have a chance to ask questions. So again, please use the Q&A to type in your questions. We're going to be getting to that in just a few minutes. And uh, we've got a few coming in. Love to get a few more. All right. So Paris, getting, getting back to the numbers again, um, mm -hmm. when you take all the different aspects do we have a sense, is this like a trillion dollars of potential waste in the system? You know, mm -hmm. we, we've got a multi-trillion dollar healthcare economy, as I said, it's 20% of the total economy. Mm -hmm. When you start to look at it all and, and the impact, and you put all those individual bubbles together, are we getting close to that kind of magnitude? I, I believe we would, uh, because uh, there was a study uh, done, a uh, simulation study done on future elderly model that they um, they looked at the uh, effect of um, cost of racial ethnic uh, disparities in chronic diseases. And uh, they showed that there is potential, if we assume that uh, by imp improving representation, we can um, reduce the disparities by modest effect there is potential for, uh, say, billions of dollars uh, in saving in uh, just chronic conditions, heart disease, diabetes, and add to that this, um, potential savings in cancer, add to that potential savings in other fields that we know that uh, disparities exist in all fields of uh, healthcare. So I believe that there is a significant uh, potential for savings. And when we think about the cost, that cost is shared societally. It's our mm -hmm. right, it's reflected in our taxes. It's yeah. you know, challenges our our, mm -hmm. our Medicare solvency in this country. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, again, there's this pass through effect where there's kind of a almost a thematic element when we go back to Alex's beginning comments and work through that. Patients almost become vic you know they're they're treated as if as if they're victims, mm -hmm. um, and. And, and somehow they're somewhat responsible. I remember it was very hard getting into oncology um, because there was almost like certain patients, lung cancer, because at that point in time, it was almost all smoking uh, induced that, you know, they, they made their bed, they're going to lie in it. Um, it it's, it's horrible. You know, it's kind of a true confession, but, but there's that reality in kind of medicine that we kind of look at patients are, you know, bring it upon themselves. And, mm -hmm it almost seems to be a way to, to rationalize so many aspects of the broken system. But even if we take that attitude, again, if we go back to economics, we're all paying for that. And so whether, again, the, whether it's the, whether it's just the right thing to do, or if you're not, if you're not comfortable with that, the right economic thing to do, it seems like economics will likely be the driver. Is the messaging adequate at this point, when you look through your literature, that as Alice talked about, message is critical here, that we still need to get more messaging to understand the economic cost of not fixing the system? Um, that, that question was for me, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think um, we, um, we know the numbers. Um, like it is very clear. There was, um, there was uh, like I mentioned, there is this simulation that uh, has been done on future elderly model, and it is it makes it clear that uh, there is benefit in uh, economic savings, and this uh, messaging could be expanded to other fields of uh, healthcare, cancer, or, um, and uh, to other fields that uh, there are disparities. And I believe that messaging of it might be recent. It, it has been started recently, uh, but uh, I'm expecting um, everybody to be um, e exposed to the messaging and uh, ac accepting the reality that this is not only the right thing to do, but it also has an economic impact. Danielle, do you think that's happening at the methodologic level? You know, just is there kind of a fear that, you know, from the regulatory bodies that you never can mention economics? 
right? Somehow it can never be done because of it being the economic thing to do. It has to have some other reason. Or do you think the economic messaging is now part of the messaging? I think the economic messaging is out there, but it all depends on who it reaches and who it resonates with. And health communications is a whole field of study that pays attention to who is the audience and how do we craft the message to resound with that audience. And also through what networks do we spread that message? Is it the news? Is it through faith leaders? Is it through community? Uh, you know, maybe it's the bridge club that, you know, a bunch of people meet at every month. And who is the one who says that message? Does that person look like the people who are receiving the message? So while the economic message is important, it might not resonate with everyone, but it is one of our strongest um, things to hang our hat upon that if we don't take the efforts to really consider who is who the medication is for, how it's going to work in the real world, we're, we're really doing a huge economic disservice to society at large. All right. So, Alex, we started with you. We'll wrap this up with you before we go to Q and A, and still, still with this focus on the economic impact of, mm -hmm. of what's happening. When we we think back to this history that you provided um, about recognizing ethical ethics in healthcare and the impact on diversity in healthcare, much of that was done more for based on policy reasons and not based on economics. And now we're getting to a point where there is some success and it's been introduced in a regulatory way, but it seems like to, to expedite that success, there's that need to have that recognition that it's going to significantly reduce overall costs because that is still the primary focus. We hear about every day coming out of DC mm -hmm. is not just yeah. the ethics of healthcare, it's about the cost of healthcare. We've got to do something to lower the cost. Mm -hmm. And rather than think about it just of paying less for a drug that's been developed, mm -hmm. it makes a lot more sense to reduce the cost of developing the drug. And the question is, do, do you see that as something that that has that has legs that's gonna that's gonna help to, to make this happen quicker? Or are we mm -hmm. still stuck in some of these issues that you described in the history? Well, it's a, it's a multifactorial issue, Dr. Feinberg, but in general, it has legs because the FDA is giving it legs. They are requiring that underrepresentation in clinical trials be addressed prior to receiving the funding. So in that sense, there's your economics right there. Um, but I think as far as drug development goes, I'm certainly not a, a fan of the uh, way that we do it here in the US. I know there are um, nations in which it's a lot cheaper. Um, I don't know that that has too many legs. I think we are going the right direction, maybe with biosimilars and unbranded versions of biologics. But that to me is going to be a long, long way from where they are, let's say, in, in Europe in, in these same situations. But I do think that we are going the right direction. Um, I read an article recently on JCO on Journal of Clinical Oncology, and they suggested making a least acceptable number of each type of patient in a trial. So the least acceptable per race, ethnicity, sex, and other characteristics. So I do think that it has teeth and I do think it's going in the right direction overall. All right. We got questions. So we're going to do the start our Q&A. We'll start. Daniel, I think this was first one's for you. All right. Has real world evidence shown poor outcome safety efficacy in underrepresented populations studied and studied as compared to the clinical trials after adjusting adjusting for all possible observed confounders? Well, it's difficult to make a statement about it goes one way or the other way, because as we see in science, it goes every way. Sometimes what happens in the real world population is pretty similar to what happens in the clinical trial. Other times, those in the real world will be performing better than those in the clinical trial, and other times, they'll be performing worse than the clinical trial. So it's difficult to say, you know, in general, 
does the real world have poor outcomes than the clinical trial? Um, but what we can say is that in general, people who are in the real world tend to have fewer resources and fewer social advantages than people who are in clinical trials. So it's even difficult to make the comparison of real world patients versus clinical trial patients because they come from a very different baseline. So, you know, thinking about Alex's visual on equity versus equality, we are all right, you know, very different body types and we all need very different bikes <laughs> where in a clinical trial, um, the body types are more similar than they are in the real world. So that's a great question. And it's really a case by case by basis. And that provides us with some great founding reason to do the research of real world evidence. And, and there are, I mean, again, on that case by case basis, there's lots of individual cases where mm -hmm. drugs came into a market and possibly, uh, so I'll give you a, just a couple that I dealt with in my own practice for yeah, you know, to great. share with, with our audience. But um, uh, the first breakthrough in colon cancer after 30 years was a drug called rinitecan. There were studies done in Europe, studies done in the US, slight different study designs and methodologies in the US. It was combined with 5-FU, the standard drug that had been available for three decades and called IFL. Um, met with a great deal of anticipation in 1999, was approved. My practice, which was very large, uh, we had lots of patients who we were hoping would live long enough and they were hoping to live long enough to receive it. My first patient gets that new combination and three weeks later is in the ICU. Mm -hmm. When I was on call and rounding that weekend, my partner's patient was in the bed next to my patient in the ICU in the exact same situation. We had just developed a medical record, beginning of real world evidence with, with medical records found out that 17 of our first 20 patients ended up hospitalized who received that, that regimen. Yeah. And it turns out within four years, that experience had been exponentially grown. And that approach to using that drug was no longer acceptable. And we were using a different approach that was developed in Europe. Now, when you look at that real world evidence, it wasn't necessarily one study but it's a great case example of why real world evidence can be different. And when we looked at our own patients, our 20, um, in the clinical trial, none of the patients had prior fluorouracil. Our patients all had it. Our patients were average 10 years older. The trial patients mm -hmm. were 62. The average age of colon cancer is 72. You start going down that list of the eligibility, ineligibility differences that don't make it real mm -hmm. are very much you know, at the root of it in terms of explanation. So there's definitely is data, but you, you're right. It's a case by case. You can't say in general, it's always going to show one direction. All right. Next question. i um, not sure who's going to get this. So all pay attention. How do inequalities in access to health insurance contribute to the issues? For example, persons without insurance are less likely to be receiving care and be represented in real world evidence, especially in data sets that are primarily comprised of those with employer-sponsored health insurance. With lots of, lots of un to unpack here, as we <laughs> talked about medical records. And further, they wouldn't necessarily be easily identified in EHRs or EMRs for clinical trial recruitment. Can you comment? Anybody? I'll take first that. So there is a lot there, and there's a lot of moving pieces. So the first is, do patients who are uninsured not get reflected? And so there are databases, right? In, in diseases like cancer, most patients who actually get the diagnosis will end up receiving Medicare or Medicaid. So mm -hmm. they usually will have government insurance, but for those that don't, they do get treatment and there are certain safety net hospitals for where there are medical records that you know could help in understanding that story. Um, so a lot of stuff here, but I, I think that it's not just a matter of looking at a commercially insured data set to get your information. And it's also about maybe going to the electronic medical record and why that's been so important. Um, and so Danielle, I'll go back to you because a lot of the work that you do is around chart abstracted data as opposed to commercial, the historical commercial insurance data sets. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, most of my research revolves around chart abstraction, which is we will have a particular disease that we are studying, oftentimes with a particular drug, and we'll have our inclusion and exclusion criteria and go into medical records and abstract, take out the data that relates to our interests. So what really resonates with me about this question is that we can't study what we don't have. So how do we get those data? And if people are unable to access healthcare because of health insurance issues, those patients do sometimes eventually make it into healthcare, but they make it much later. Mm -hmm. So I used to work at Levine Cancer Institute, which is a medical safety net hospital. And patients would be found with cancer because they present to the emergency room coughing up blood and it's stage four lung cancer. So diseases are found much later when people are unable to access preventive care or they delay so far because they worry about the cost until it is so extreme that they are, you know, in dire dire need of health care and then that's when they access health care. So you need to know where to look. And those patients' data are available in EMRs, but we just don't have what would be there for them if they were able to access healthcare sooner and in more appropriate um, fashion that everyone deserves. All right, Parissa, back to you. The question is, does, this, does the economic impact you describe translate to healthcare systems outside of the U.S.? Yes, I, I, I think it does. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, diversity doesn't just mean racial et ethnic diversity. Uh, it also means diversity by age. Uh, you gave a great example of how um, a treatment didn't work as it was supposed to when you use it for older patients and patients that had comorbidities. So if we include those patients, we will have a better estimate and more realistic estimate of effectiveness. And actually one other thing that is important is that usually clinical results from clinical trials have been used for pricing and reimbursement decisions. And uh, real world evidence can actually help with uh, providing evidence on the effectiveness and um, payers can use the uh, real, world, uh, um, real world effectiveness of uh, the treatment to negotiate the prices. Maybe uh, the treatment is not as effective, maybe the price should be lower. So there's also a potential here, economic potential here, um, here as well. It, it, it applies for every country, I believe. All right. Thank you, Parisa. All right. I think we've got time for one more. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. We won't get, to, I'm not going to get to all of them. Um, all right. Uh, Alex, um, you mentioned that the government redefined, recognized race as a social construct, but for trials, it seems like race is being linked to biology. So that's the question, and can you expand on that? So first, do you do you agree that 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 was the framing, or so? If, but address it as best you can. Sure. Uh, so I don't think the government has uh, has come to light regard, regarding race. That was the AMA, so it's just one institution here in um, in America. But um, I think the the redefinition is the other part of that policy is also not to use race as a proxy in clinical research or medicine and the, the, the reason for that is as you may as everyone may know with all this increasing talk of chat gpt and language models algorithms have for decades been actually uh, disadvantaging people who use healthcare less so the risk basing is on usage. So if I, as a white woman, go to the doctor every time something hurts, I'm not saying that I do, but it, the perception is I might because I can, um, I would be risk, I would be scored as having more risk and I would get more resources directed toward me. Whereas someone who never uses the healthcare system, like uh, Danielle was saying, someone who shows up to the emergency room coughing up blood, they're off the grid. They're not going to be known, they're not going to be on our radar, let's say, as scientists to do real world evidence. So um, I, I don't know that there's really an easy answer to that, but I think we're far, far away from the government um, coming to that conclusion that race is actually social. All right. We have used up our allotted time. So I know there is a, a slide for a couple 
let's advance that for some closing out comments. So first, um, I want to thank everyone for participating and we're going to, um, and that's us as a group. I want to thank you, but um, we also have some comments uh, to come from scientists.com and health economics so that before you go, um, please stay on for one more minute. I want to let you know that there is a website there. If you want more information about Cardinal and let me then transfer it over to Sydney. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you to all of our speakers today. It was really wonderful to have you with us. In closing, we hope that you enjoyed this healtheconomics.com webinar sponsored by Cardinal Health, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.